excerpts from President Calvin Coolidge's third annual message of December 8, 1925. Members of Congress, in meeting the constitutional requirement of informing the Congress upon the State of the Union, it is exceedingly gratifying to report that the general condition is one of progress and prosperity. Here and there are comparatively small and apparently temporary difficulties needing adjustment and improved administrative methods, such as are always to be expected. But in the fundamentals of government and business, the results demonstrate that we are going in the right direction. <clears throat> the country does not appear to require radical departures from the policies already adopted, so much as it needs a further extension of these policies and the improvement of details. The age of perfection is still in the somewhat distant future, but it is more in danger of being retarded by mistaken government activity than it is from lack of legislation. We are by far the most likely to accomplish permanent good if we proceed with moderation. In our country, the people are sovereign and independent and must accept the resulting responsibilities. It is their duty to support themselves and support the government. That is the business of the nation, whatever the charity of the nation may require. The functions which the Congress are to discharge are not those of local government but of national government. The greatest solicitude should be exercised to prevent any encroachment upon the rights of the states or the various political subdivisions. Local self-government is one of our most precious possessions. It is the greatest contributing factor to the stability, strength, liberty, and progress of the nation. It is not to be infringed by assault or undermined by purchase. It ought not abdicate its power through weakness or resign its authority through favor. It does not at all follow that because abuses exist, <coughs> abuses exist, it is the concern of the federal government to attempt the reform. Society is in much more danger from encumbering the national government beyond its wisdom to comprehend or its ability to administer than from leaving the local communities to bear their own burdens and remedy their own evils. Our, our local habit and custom is so strong. Our variety of race and creed is so great. The federal authority is so tenuous that the area within which it can function successfully is very limited. The wiser policy is to leave the localities so far as we can possess of their own sources of revenue and charged with their own obligations. On government economy, it is a fundamental principle of our country that the people are sovereign. While they recognize the undeniable authority of the state, they have established, established as its instrument a government of limited powers. They hold in violet in their hands, own hands, the jurisdiction over their own freedom and the ownership of their own property. Neither of these can be impaired except by due process of law. The wealth of our country is not public wealth, but private wealth. It does not belong to the government, it belongs to the people. The government has no justification in taking private property except for a public purpose. It is always necessary to keep these principles in mind in the laying of taxes and in the making of appropriations. No right exists to levy, levy a dollar or to order the expenditure of a dollar of the money of the people, except for a necessary public purpose duly authorized by the Constitution. The power over the purse is the power over liberty. <clears throat> On immigration, while not enough time has elapsed to afford a conclusive demonstration, such results as have been secured indicate that our immigration law is on the whole beneficial. 
It is undoubtedly a protection of the wage earners of this country. The situation should, however, be carefully surveyed in order to ascertain whether it is working a needless hardship upon the, our own inhabitants. If it deprives them of the comfort of society of those bound to them by close family ties, such modifications should be adopted as will afford relief, always in accordance with the principle that our government owes its first duty to our own people, and that no alien inhabitant of another country has any legal rights whatever under our Constitution and laws. It is only through treaty or through residence here that such rights accrue. But we should not, however, be forgetful of obligations of a common humanity. While our country numbers among its best citizens, many of those of foreign birth, yet those who now enter in violation of our laws by that very act thereby place themselves in a class of undesirables. If in investigation reveals that any considerable number are coming here in defiance of our immigration restrictions, it will undoubtedly create the necessity for the registration of all aliens. We ought to have no prejudice against an alien because he is an alien. The standard which we apply to our inhabitants is that of manhood, not place of birth. Restrictive immigration is to a large degree for economic purposes. It is, it is applied in order that we may not have a larger annual increment of good people within our borders than we can weave into our economic fabric in such a way as to supply their needs without undue injury to ourselves. In conclusion, it is apparent that we are reaching into an era of great general prosperity. It will continue only so long as we can use, use it properly. After all, there is but a fixed quantity of wealth in this country at any fixed time. The only way that we can all secure more of it is to create more. The element of time enter, enters into production. If the people have sufficient moderation and contentment to be willing to improve their condition by the process of enlarging production, eliminating waste and distributing equitably a prosperity almost without limit lies before it. If the people are to be dominated by selfishness, seeking immediate riches by non-productive speculation and by wasteful quarreling over the returns from industry, they will be confronted by the inevitable results of depression and privation. If they will continue industrious and thrifty, contented with fair wages and moderate profits, and the returns which accrue from the development of our natural resources, our prosperity will extend itself indefinitely. In all your deliberations, you should remember that the purpose of legislation is to translate principles into action. It is an effort to have our country be better by doing better. Because the thoughts and ways of people are firmly fixed and not easily changed, the field within which immediate improvement can be secured is very narrow. Legislation can provide opportunity. Whether it is taken advantage of or not depends upon the people themselves. The government of the United States has been created by the people. It is solely responsible to them. It will be most successful if it is conducted solely for their benefit. All its efforts will be of little avail unless they brought more justice, more enlightenment, more happiness and prosperity into the home. This means an opportunity to observe religion, secure education, and earn a living under a reign of law and order. It is the growth and improvement of the material and spiritual life of the nation. We shall not be able to gain these ends merely by our own action. If they come at all, it will be, it will be because we have been willing to work in harmony with the abiding purpose of a divine providence.